Um, okay, so today we'll be talking about expectations' role in perceptual decision making, and uh, this is a paper from Christopher Summerfield, who is um, a professor of cognitive neuroscience at Oxford, and Floris Delange, who is a professor at the Donders Institute at Radboud University in the Netherlands. Um, so I'm going to start with a, a little demo. So in this demo, uh, I'm going to flash a scene on the screen for a brief moment, and the task is to find the toothbrush somewhere in the scene. It's only going to be up there for about a second, so try your best to find it. Ready? Three, two, one... Okay, now let me know, did you find the toothbrush? Yeah, it was on the rug. Nice, nice job, Ben. Um, so we're going to do this again. We're going to do this one more time. Again, the same task, find the toothbrush. And again, it will only be briefly presented for about a second. Okay, so I'm going to show it in three, two, one. Okay, did you find the toothbrush? All right, Molly found it. It was on the sink. So uh, let's talk more about uh, what this demo is supposed to show. So here's the scene that I just presented. The toothbrush is on the sink, but you might notice that there's something odd about it. In this case, the toothbrush is very big. Um, it, it's, it's unexpectedly big, you might say. And in the other example, the toothbrush was normal size, but in an unexpected location on the rug. And what Eckstein did with these experiments is he presented objects in either an unnatural location or an unexpected size, and then compared it with visual search when the, the object was in its expected location on the sink and, in, and also in its expected size. And people were slower and less accurate to find the toothbrush when it was an unexpected size or, or in an unexpected location. And this is particularly interesting because in the second example, the toothbrush is taking up more space in the scene. It's taking up more real estate. And usually a larger target means that it's easier to find. But in this case, the toothbrush is harder to find, despite it being so big. And this is just an example of how, um, without ever even seeing the scene before, we're using expectations to guide our... Um, perception or our ability to look through this, this scene. And um, we know that the human brain rapidly processes scenes utilizing relationships among objects and global properties to guide search towards likely target locations. Um, and this, this occurs um, all the time, whether we are conscious of it or not, we're always using expectations to guide our, our perception, our ability to navigate, our ability to look through things. Um, is it, It's expectation for both. Um, so it's when it's in an unexpected location or if it's an unexpected size, it takes longer and we're worse to find the toothbrush. Um, basically, this is just an example to show that um, we're better when things are matching our expectations and our expectations are rapidly um, utilized in cases of, say, visual search. But the major point of the paper is that um, expectation plays a role in how we see or how we perceive um, our environment or the things around us. And um, when we typically talk about behavioral psychology experiments, um, people typically where researchers typically use counterbalanced conditions and they, they equate the probability of um, their manipulations. And this is important, of course, because we want to make sure that the effect that is eventually found is due to the things that we manipulate. But oftentimes this is taking for 
this is not taking into account um, the role of expectation. Um, the idea that, that already when we're perceiving things, we take into account um, these factors of expectation. Um, even though that we know the visual system capitalizes on information like stimulus frequency and conditional probabilities and um, temporal autocorrelation, which is just a fancy way to say that um, an image or some visual input over time is typically stable. So if you look outside the window and you see a tree, over time, typically, you're still going to see the tree in that location. Um, and we use all of these things to build um, expectations about visual input um, and, and how we then process that information. Um, to give another example, in language, um, infants have been shown to learn transitional probabilities between uh, sensory events. So um, in a famous study by uh, Richard Aslan, he presented this fake made-up robo language um, to infants, and certain phonemes were more likely to occur um, with other phonemes in this fake language. Um, and the, the infants were just listening in on this, and then later on they presented the phonemes without their matching counterpart, and then infants um, responded differently to these um, to these mismatched phonemes in this fake language um, by um, having a, a longer looking response to the output of the of the audio. Um, and that was then taken to be an inference about how infants are using statistical learning to pick up on language and to learn language. Um, so obviously expectation is a pretty fundamental concept. The question though is how does the brain actually use or compute these um, expectations and how does this information integrate with perceptual decision making? And by the way, perceptual decision making is just a way to say um, the process of um, knowing what we're looking at. So, you know, the visual input um, from the outside world does not necessarily have a one to one relate relationship with how we perceive it. And so how we perceive things has its own sort of decision process for transforming the uh, sensory um, information outside to how we um, interpret it um, in the brain. And, and finally, we also want, the article also talks about how expectation plays a role in attention and adaptation literature, which we'll talk about near the end. Um, so let's see here. So here I have a square. It's, um, it's cut out from a painting from Edgar Degas. And, uh, it's a pretty grainy square. It's kind of hard to tell what the square is. But if you took some time um, to sort of parse it out, you might have a good guess at what this is an image of, right? Um, but it would certainly help if we had some context. So if I show you the full painting, then this probably makes a bit more uh, sense. So if, if you see the other ballerinas in the picture and you look at this say the bottom left square, then it's pretty easy to acknowledge that the top left square is of a ballerina's face. Um, basically, we can use information around us in context to build expectations for other visual input. And so we can reach a faster conclusion about what we're seeing if we have nearby evidence to suggest what it is. So without the context, you could probably maybe think it's a ballerina's face, but it would take longer than if you had the surrounding context to build your expectation or to better accumulate this evidence for what you're seeing. Um, and if we're now going to talk about some of the possible ways that people have gone about modeling this, um, the paper discusses three potential models. Um, the third one is perhaps the most important that they discuss, but we're briefly going to talk about these other two formal models of perceptual choice. And by the way, these models are not only used in perceptual choice, they're used in a, a large array of different literature. But um, the first model is signal detection theory. Um, basically, how this works is, is uh, it's saying that decisions are made with respect to the relative likelihood of evidence provided by the stimulus given one option or another. Um, I think an easy way to um, introduce this is to just say, um, imagine that you're a doctor 
and you're diagnosing people um, and you've got to tell a patient whether they are likely to have a tumor or not. And if you think that they might have a tumor, then you suggest that they pay for this extra scan and it might cause some emotional distress, but it's very important that they get it looked at. Um, on the contrary, you might say, oh, I don't think you have a tumor and uh, have a nice day and see you in a couple months. Basically, there are these two normal distributions that um, reflect the accumulated evidence that the person has a tumor or not. So based on your many years of experience as a doctor, um, you, you can accumulate evidence for these two possible um, decisions. Um, so the red distribution is evidence that they don't have a tumor, the signal being absent, and the black distribution being that they do have a tumor, um, the signal being present. And the criterion is the only subjective component in this model, and that can move towards the left or to the right. And this, this shift of the criterion um, can reflect um, the bias of the doctor in this example. So if you had a more um, conservative doctor, meaning that they're less likely to tell you that they have a tumor, then the criterion would move towards the right. Um, so they need more evidence to suggest that you have a tumor um, because they know about the uh, emotional, the mental um, distress and the costs associated with recommending that you have um, further tests. On the opposite side, you might have a liberal doctor. Their criterion shifts towards the left, meaning that they're more likely to recommend that you get checked out because you should always err on the side of um, getting things looked at if there might be any possibility of a problem. Um, so in, in this case, it's the criterion that can represent the expectation. So the expectation is sort of this um, flexible criterion that can shift left or right towards what you... Um, before seeing this, the, the test or the stimulus or whatever it is, um, what you're more likely to um, decide on between two options. Um, and we'll see when we look at the other two models that, that this signal detection theory is a little bit limited. Um, that'll hopefully become evident when we talk about the other models. Um, secondly, we have a, a sequential sampling model, in this case, the drift diffusion model. Um, and how this works is that um, evidence is now said to accumulate over time. So we're adding this temporal component to things. So imagine an example where you're looking at an assortment of moving dots and you're trying to figure out, are the dots moving towards the right? Or are they moving towards the left? Um, if you have more time to look at this display, then your confidence about whether most of the dots are moving towards the right or the left is going to increase. You're going to be more confident about your judgment. And how the model works is that this accumulation of evidence is represented by this moving red line. And once the evidence has accumulated enough or you're confident enough about your decision, then um, the red line hits one of these two decision boundaries. And once your evidence accumulation has crossed a decision boundary, then that's basically when you can make that decision of, of what you're seeing in the case of perception or in the case of any sort of decision making um, model using drift diffusion. And how expectation factors into this model is the onset of um, the, the red line. So just to back uh, a little away, the X can represent the dots moving towards the right, for instance. The Y line can represent the dots moving towards the left. And so if the red line hits the X line, that means that the decision boundary for the dots moving to the right has been reached, and you conclude that the dots are moving towards the right. Um, if, however, you've seen many different um, trials where the dots are typically moving towards the right, you might have an expectation that the dots are going to move towards the right, and thus you start the evidence accumulation near that decision boundary. Um, so in both of these models, they incorporate expectation as um, an additive offset I guess, in the pre-stimulus um, evidence. Um, so in signal detection theory, the expectation is represented by adjusting the criterion left or right. And in the drift diffusion model, it's represented by adjusting the placement of the origin for, the, for this drift diffusion case. Um, now, that's great. We have a, a, a way to represent expectation computationally, but does this actually happen in the brain? 
is is the next question. Like, it, are these models actually grounded on uh, on results that we can look at from um, like neuroimaging um, and neurophysiology? So let's go back to the moving dots example. Let's say that we have an observer, in this case, say a monkey with electrodes in, in their brain. Um, and, and they have this expectation that a moving dot array is going to be majority dots moving towards the right. So they've seen many trials where the dots are moving towards the right, only a couple where they're moving towards the left. And so they expect the next, the next test stimulus to be dots moving mostly to, towards the right. Um, before the test stimulus even shows up, uh, we can look at neurons that are being recorded, and these neurons are um, right or left preferring neurons. We know that neurons have receptive fields. They're receptive to certain um, visual input. These neurons are that are being recorded are either left direction preferring neurons or right direction preferring neurons. And before this test stimulus even appears, the right preferring neurons have an increase in baseline firing rate uh, in comparison to the left preferring neurons. So it's as if, and again, this is in, in sensory regions, it's as if the, 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 the stimulus it, it, that, bef the stimulus that is presented has already been presented and it's already accumulating evidence, um, for the dots moving towards the right. Basically, it's already having increased activation as if it were seeing the dots moving towards the right. And in this figure, it's basically just reiterating what I just said, but with different priors. So um, they used a motion coherence task, but it's basically the same thing for um, a direction task with moving dots. But um, they put these electrodes in a macaque monkey, and they record the baseline firing rate. And before the test stimulus even occurs, there's already activation as if it were looking at dots moving in the expected direction. And we don't necessarily have to use um, electrodes in the brain. We can use MEG. Um, we can see that there's increased lateralized low frequency oscillatory activity in the area of the brain representing motion. Um, in fMRI, we can look at bold um, activation, basically just increases in activation signaled by some sort of predictive cue that's presented to a person. So um, I guess specifically, let me give an example. So if you see the word face and you know that that word means that you're about to see a face, then before you see the face, the area of the brain that represents the visual representation of faces, the FFA, <clears throat> has already increased its, its activation Ex expecting a face that hasn't yet been presented. Um, and even if we don't present a stimulus, so let's say that someone is looking at visual gratings and they just are, are seeing a visual grading one at a time repeatedly, and all of a sudden the grading is no longer on the screen. <clears throat> when the when the grading is emitted, then the 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 brain still expects that that grading is going to occur, and the emission of the grading still leads to neural acti activity patterns in early visual areas that are uh, re reflective of the same sort of pattern of activation as if the grading did occur. So if it was strongly expe expected, then the sensory regions are activating as if it had actually seen it, even when... It, when you didn't see it. Um, so basically, in summation, um, expectations may bias neural activity in sensory areas, pushing the interpretation of sensory information towards one perceptual hypothesis or towards another one. Um, so this is great. Um, so if we expect something, we get increased activation in the area that represents the expected stimulus. But unfortunately, um, it's not quite as um, simple or, or straightforward. Um, so let's talk about this idea of expectation suppression. Um, expectation suppression is the idea that expected stimuli tend to dampen and reduce amplitude of cortical potentials. Um, so here's an example. Let's say that a blue square is indicative of a face that is about to appear. 
Um, and so the observer knows that when they see a blue square, typically they're about to see a face. So as I said before, they see the blue square. There's activation in the fusiform face area before the face even appears. And then the face does appear. And then there's still increased activation for a face being presented, which makes sense because this is the area of the brain that represents faces. Um, of course, there's going to be some level of activation here. Um, but now let's say that the observer also knows that a green square is representative of a place or a building about to appear instead of a face. However, in this rare instance, the green square is then followed by a face and not a place. And this is going contrary to our expectations. Um, so what happens then is that there isn't like there isn't an increase in firing an FFA before the face is presented, but when the face is presented, there is a very strong increase in um, activation in the FFA, more so than if the face was preceded by the blue square. Um, and at first, this seems a little counterintuitive because um, basically the brain was, pr in the blue square case, the brain was preparing for the face and then it had higher activity for the face and then the face did occur and then you would expect there to be more activity overall than in the case of the green square um is this at the same time or is there a delay yeah there is a delay um so basically the the idea is that um we can measure the activity in the ffa um immediately before the stimulus comes up and um when the stimulus is on screen so in the delay, there is increased activation when they see the blue square, um, but there isn't an increase in activation in FFA when they see the green square, because the green square leads you to expect a place to occur, not a face. The problem is when the face does occur. In the expected case, the face occurs and there's an increase in FFA. In the unexpected case, the face occurs and there's an even greater response to the face in FFA than in the case where the face was expected. And this is a bit of a problem because it's not really accounted for in the two models that we had just talked about. Um, so maybe, maybe our two models aren't good enough. Um, you know, it can offer a simple way to understand perception, bias by expectation, but um, it's not really accounting for, or these models aren't really accounting for the neurophysiology that seems to be present with, say, expectation suppression. Um, and one of the things that these models are not incorporating that the authors talk about being important um, is that the visual system is hierarchically organized. Um, and when I say that, I mean that the size and the complexity of receptive fields increases with subsequent processing stages. And there's also another aspect that's not incorporated by the models, and that's how neural messages feed forwards, say from early visual cortex to um, FFA or later areas of the brain. Um, but neural messages can feed forwards like this, but also backwards. So from, say, the FFA back to early visual areas. And oftentimes these backwards projections um, outnumber the amount of forwards projections by a large margin. And this is also not really taken into account by the two proposed models. So the authors then say that we can look at this idea of predictive coding, which does take into account some of these ideas of neurophysiology. Um, and, and like the sequential sampling model, the drift diffusion model, um, both of these cases are taking into account the temporal the aspect of accumulating evidence over time. This is an iterative Bayesian framework. Um, but in this case, the predictive coding model is able to um, incorporate this backwards and forwards um, constant updating of information between hierarchical regions of the brain. Um, so uh, let's say, for instance, that uh, someone sees a blue square and um, then the blue square is followed by a face and they've seen this happen a couple of times. So when they see 
the the face followed by a blue square. Um, the face, the visual input of the face hits the retina, um, goes to the optic nerve, the optic chiasm, the thalamus, and it eventually first hits um, the back of the brain in the early visual cortex. And here it interprets the low-level information um, present in that image. And then, after it processes that, it flows that information forward into other areas of the brain, of course. This is kind of a simplification, but eventually it hits the FFA, um, responsible for representing faces. And um, after the FFA um, receives this information, perhaps that information will flow towards um, more frontal areas of the brain. Um, again, this is a vast oversimplification, and I don't really deal with predictive coding. I'm not an expert on this. This is just trying to give a kind of overview about how this works. But say that the frontal area of the brain is representing the association between the blue stimulus and then the face occurring. I'm not quite sure whether prefrontal cortex is the right region to represent here, but we can just say that for now. Um, so now that the prefrontal cortex or whatever region this is has has accumulated evidence of this association between the blue square and the face, it can feed back a prediction or a prior that the blue square and the face are kind of matched or linked together in some way. And that prior can feed back into the FFA, and then the FFA can incorporate this information and then also feed back priors into the early visual cortex. Um, and when we now introduce the example of, say, the green square, right? So let's say that a green square is presented and the early visual cortex sees the green square. It feeds that information into the FFA. Well, um, the, the FFA and then, you know, all these other regions of the brain are now expecting a place to be presented and not a, and, and not a face. So the priors are now updated and ready to expect a place. In fact, the FFA is already responding as if there was a place presented. But then, um, unexpectedly, a face shows up, and the early visual cortex is like, oh no, I didn't expect this one, and there's a large error term, but it has to feed that information forward anyway. It goes to the FFA. The FFA is like, oh man, this ain't good. Um, there's a huge error term again. Um, that evidence then feeds through towards the frontal cortex. The frontal cortex says, oh man, my expectations are all messed up. Let's update those priors. It gets feed, fed back through the earlier regions of the brain. Um, and, and how you can imagine this is that the, the error term is, is sort of like an oh shit moment for that region of the brain. And it needs to now activate towards something that it wasn't expecting. And that you can kind of think of as an increase in activation. Um, and when it's the case that the expectation is correct, we can sort of think of it as the neural activity elicited by the expected event can be explained away by the predictions, by the backwards flowing um, information, the priors. Um, so if the FFA is already firing as if the face is presented and then a face does get presented, then it doesn't have an increase necessarily in activation because it was already ready and primed for that face to show up. And so this model can, to some degree, explain why the expectation suppression effect is a thing. Because when um, a region is expecting a stimulus and then the stimulus does occur, we don't need an increase in activation because it was already responding as if that was going to occur anyway. When there's an unexpected event, then it needs to respond differently, and there's a large um, um, increase in activation. Um, so predictive coding can explain how visual responses are modulated by context to the, to, in this sort of example. Um, and there's another aspect of neurophysiology. By the way, again, feel free to stop me at any time if I'm going too fast. Um, there's another aspect of neurophysiology that the predictive coding model can explain, and that is the concept of end-stopping. So this goes all the way back to Hubel and Wiesel. Um, 
in in the primary visual cortex, neurons display this thing called end stopping, and basically these these neurons in V1 they're tuned for orientation, right? So these neurons they they prefer a certain orientation of line, say 30 degrees oriented line. And so if it sees an oriented line that's 30 degrees, it's going to increase its firing rate. And if it doesn't see something that's 30 degrees, it's going to decrease its firing rate. The, the end stopping is a paradoxical effect where um, a line can be presented in the receptive field of that neuron, and yet it won't respond optimally. And this is the case when the line is, say, extending past the receptive field, like it's a, it's a larger stimulus than um, the receptive field can handle. But it doesn't make sense because the receptive field only has access to information within its receptive field, in this case represented by the black dotted square. So how is it able to um, reduce its firing due to um, information outside of its receptive field? It doesn't make sense. Well, what's what's thought happens is that um, the neuron um, the neuron receives um, information from um, backwards projections that can explain away the the signals um, present in V one. So um, these are sort of like uh, ex these are called extra classical receptive field effects, where and it can occur in various um, early visual um, cortex regions. Um, where a neuron responds differently to information outside of its receptive field. And this can, this has been demonstrated to be a thing because, um, one study took some squirrel monkeys and, um, they, uh, temporarily lesioned the, uh, transfer of information from V1 to later visual regions. And after this temporary lesion, um, they, they, looked at the neural firing in V1 and end stopping was no longer a thing. And so it's, it's thought that the backwards feedback of information was responsible for this um, concept of end stopping. And you can even demonstrate this in humans. So um, if we were to do transcranial magnetic stimulation to say area MT, which represents motion, um, we can, and we did this to a human, then we can see that there's a, uh, a, a, a sort of end stopping for detection of motion. So for instance, if we were to be perceiving an illusory motion signal in normal conditions, that would um, no longer be the case due to the TMS to MT, um, if that makes sense. Because the illusory motion signal in this case was due to higher level information. Um, and as another example of how this is a thing, um, Rao and Ballard in 1999, they constructed a hierarchical predictive coding model. And um, they tested this model on a bank of naturalistic images. And then they looked at the filters from the model which were, are kind of analogous to um, early visual area filters. And the filters that they found from the model uh, closely matched the receptive fields of neurons in the visual system, and these filters also displayed end stopping. So predictive coding can explain um, expectation suppression and end stopping. Uh, let's go back to the example of like illusory... Um, perceptual information. So um, this is the Kinesa triangle. It's an illusory um, it's an illusory contour. So we see this um, we see what appears to be a white triangle in the middle, even though there isn't really a white triangle, it's empty space. Um, but predictive coding can also explain neural responses to visual features that are not present but suggested by elements outside of a receptive field. So if you were to look at early visual neurons responding to these illusory contours of this triangle, you would see activation for the, the, the lines that represent the illusory triangle, even though technically there's no sensory information um, about there being a triangle there. It's all due to the context 
that would be reflected by later processing being fed back. Um, and uh, another study, so uh, these extra classical receptive field effects can also be observed with um, fMRI. So in this study, subjects viewed natural images in, um, they viewed them twice, uh, once just the full image, the control, and another time um, occluded, meaning that a quadrant of this image was cut off. Okay, and um, what they did then is uh, they used multivariate pattern analysis to decode the identity of the missing quadrant for those trials where the subject viewed the occluded image. And based only on looking at information represented in that quadrant, the occluded quadrant, they were able to decode what the original contents were of the control image. So they could figure out what was the missing quadrant because it was similar in activity to the actual quadrant had when they viewed the actual quad quadrant. But this is only looking at activity in that um, quadrant of visual field space. Um, all right, so let's talk about attention and expectation. How are these two things different? How are they the same? So um, selective attention, as we saw in the demo, is often guided by expectation. So uh, say that you're looking for your keys, you may allocate attention to locations where they are most likely to be found. Um, so expectation facilitates detection and recognition of um, features, locations, objects, whatever it is that are likely to be present in the environment. And selective attention is, is thought to um, facilitate perception by prioritizing these sensory inputs according to their salience or task relevance. Um, so how should at attention and expectation be differentiated if they're so kind of intertwined like this? And are they computationally uh, dissociable? Um, so perhaps it may be useful to distinguish According to the authors, it may be useful to distinguish manipulations of the probability of sensory events occurring from the relevance of a sensory input to a current task. So they label these manipulations as um, expectation and attention to distinguish themselves because a stimulus can be conditionally probable or improbable irrespective of whether it is task relevant to behavior. And so they're saying that probability is expectation and task relevance is more attention. And then they cite some studies that um, show that modulate there are neural modulations of expectations um, during periods or states of inattention. So um, neural modulations of expectation when people are asleep or when they're under anesthesia. Um, so then they say that while priors frequently guide attention, attention is not a prerequisite for the biasing effects of expectation. Um, although, I don't know, this, this part kind of confused me a little bit because do we really know that attention doesn't operate... Um, or do we really know that attention necessarily needs to be consciously allocated? Because aren't there attentional networks that may always be in operation, for instance? Um, and also they're talking about attention as necessarily being task relevant, but they also talk about it being um, due to salience, which is not necessarily under our control if we're talking about bottom-up input. Um, so at this point, Part, I was a little bit um, confused, and you'll see by the end, I, I still don't fully buy the dissociation between attention and expectation here. Um, I guess just to give an example that, um, from one of the articles that they cite um, um, of expectation while someone is asleep, the study was um, 
Infants were asleep. They heard beeps followed by a female voice when they were asleep. And there were, this, there were specific regions of the infant cortex that showed anticipatory activation in regions of the brain related to association uh, act, activity um, before the um, onset of the female voice occurring. So they conclude then that um, this is an expectation modulation and not an attentional modulation because the infants were asleep and yet they um, had increased um, activity in associative areas of the cortex. Didn't they just get brought out of sleep by the beep? Yeah, you would kind of think so, but I guess it wasn't like that harsh of a beep, um, especially for infants. I don't know. They somehow made it work. Um, I would hate to do a study with infants um, sleeping and then try to make useful conclusions based on any sort of a neuroimaging work. That just sounds like a nightmare. Um, but anyway, we shall go forward with their assumption of this uh, sort of dissociation between attention and expectation in certain um, conditions. Could they tell if they were asleep reliably? Well, I think kind of, yeah, because you can, you can gauge things like, um, like, you know, like heart rate and, um, you can maybe have a video or if, if they used EEG, then it would be more easy, but it, I, I, I don't really know the exact method that they used to tell if the infants were asleep reliably or how deep asleep they were. That would be a good question. Um. But I mean, even if, even if, like, if we assume all the protocol was legit and everything was fine, right? Um, it, it still doesn't really, to me, signal that it was an expectation effect and had nothing to do with attention. But again, like, I'm from attention based labs, so maybe I'm biased. Um, all right. So what's next? So, um, based on their definitions of how expectation and attention are working, um, they're basically saying that this is how expectation and attention um, differentially affect the predictive coding model. Um, expectation determines the precision of the priors, whereas attention um, determines the precision of the error signals. Um, so expectations encode predictions about things, while attention allows us to weight sensory information according to its relevance. And the relevance is part of this sort of adjustment-based process. Um, so in other words, expectation may determine the origin of evidence accumulation, and attention may control the, the gain of this sensory information. Um, it could, in terms of like the drift diffusion model, it could control the drift rate. Um, and there are long standing uh, evidence that indicates that probability cues bias subjects to make one response or another, whereas cues that reflect task relevance render them more sensitive to an attended feature or location. Um, but more recently, there have been some arguments that um, probability cues may um, boost gain of sensory input, meaning that um, this this most impacts weaker signals, whereas um, task relevant cues may decrease noise at decision making, increasing sensitivity for stronger signals. Um, there are different conceptualizations of attention and expectation on these models. I don't think that there's like one certified way of, of how these things get integrated. Um, so like maybe attention diverts processing away from unexpected portions of the visual signal. Maybe it diverts processing to expected portions of the visual signal. This is almost like the suppression enhancement debate in attention. Um, other people have tried to reconcile predictive coding with like the biased competition model of attention. So they say that expectation can reduce sensory responses in the absence of attention, but in the presence of attention, 
expectation can enhance sensory responses. So it's like a seesaw where if you have attention or if you don't have attention, that determines the, uh, the direction of how expectation influences um, sensory responses. Um, and so by that logic, attention may reverse expectation suppression by increasing the gain of error. Um, uh, there was another study by um, Zhang et al. that found that attention increases the gain of error, or the gain of prediction errors in category-specific extra striate regions. So if attention boosts the error signals, then neural pattern classifiers should be better able to distinguish expected signals from unexpected signals. And they did find that. Um, so there is some evidence to suggest that this is the case. But it's certainly not, um, you know, 100% um, concrete or agreed upon between people. Um, so I want to now turn our attention to the difference between um, repetition suppression and enhancement suppression. So in this study that they cite, faces could either be um, faces were presented one at a time, and there was a slight delay between faces. And um, a face could either be um, uh, shown after the same face or after a different face. So the idea is that if a face is repeated, then this is partially due to enhancement um, because of temporal autocorrelation, which is, uh, like I said before, the idea that visual input tends to stay constant. Um, and then they compared what happens in terms of FFA uh, signal when faces were repeated versus when faces alternated. And I also want to bring your attention to the figure on the right that says alteration and not alternation. I believe this is a typo in a nature neuroscience uh, or nature review paper. Um, so this happened in this paper that I caught what appears to be an error because the original paper that they cite uses the word alternation, so I'm pretty sure. But this paper and the paper that we talked about last month both had um, errors in how they portrayed figures, which I think is sort of um, funny to think about. That these really, like, these are great papers. They're high profile papers, but there's still errors involved here. Um, Okay, so what was I saying? So um, expectation um, suppression is is thought to um, partly explain the concept of repetition suppression. Repetition suppression is an attentional thing where if you later see a stimulus that you saw before, your activation for the second time that you see the stimulus is um, reduced in comparison. Um, and so here they're saying that expectation suppression can explain repetition suppression and attentional thought to be an attentional thing. Um, and so again, there's this muddy ground between expectation and attention. Um, alternatively, repetition suppression, they say, might be explained simply by a low-level adaptation or by neuronal fatigue. So you could kind of think of it as these neurons are representing a female face. You present them with another female face. They're kind of tired at this point, and they're not responding as strongly. Um, and, and this would be um, different from expectation because it's simply just a, a side effect of how neural computations come about. Um, and so to figure this out, there was one study that measured um, attenuation or reduction of bold activity in FFA to repeated faces um, that were either expected or unexpected. Um, and... The expected repetitions elicited a stronger repetition suppression, suggesting that the suppression can be partly explained by a reduction in predictive error. Um, there are also they also note that um, oh, were they looking at upside down faces? The upside down face is just the target for this study. So um, the subjects see face after face after face and they're told to press a button if a face is upside down. Um, and so in this way, they're always attending to the faces, but they're not actually making a response to the faces except for these outlier upside down faces. 
yeah, it's, it's basically an attention check to make sure that they're doing a task um, and not falling asleep and doing nothing. Um, to, yeah. Um, and um, what else? So the, the authors also contend that predictive coding, in predictive coding, there's a segregation of signals for expectation and the opposite of expectation, um, unexpectation. You could also call it violation. And this is computed at each processing stage. So when the stimuli are repeated, one may expect different subpopulations showing um, suppression or uh, enhancement. In other words, um, reduction or it, it increased um, acti activation. Um, and if you were to average across this area that represents faces, then you'll reveal um, suppression. But this might just be due to the averaging process involved in smoothing across voxels in the brain. Um, and there is indeed segregated activity patterns for repetition suppression and repetition enhancement in FFA during repeated face presentation. And um, if we look at the single cell level, distinct neurons do show preferences for um, matching or non-matching visual information. And so there is some idea, just to add on to this predictive coding model and how it works, that expectation and the idea of unexpectation are sort of independent um, processes. But I, I kind of had a, a problem with this idea of repetition suppression being partly explained by enhancement suppression because it's not just the low level um, like neuronal fatigue that leads to repetition suppression. And uh, expectation isn't always the difference in this. So for instance, in this study by Henson and colleagues, they presented faces like before. Um, and when a face was repeated, they, well, let me explain what the, the paradigm was. They presented faces one at a time, and some of the faces were famous people, and some of the faces were these uh, non-famous people. And when a non-famous person was repeated, there was... Um, repetition uh, enhancement. But when there was a famous person's face repeated, there was repetition suppression. And so this doesn't have to do with expectation, right? And this doesn't have to do with neuronal fatigue necessarily. Maybe it has somewhat to do with it. But in this case, it's, it's simply the idea of, um, well, in this case, the authors thought that um, it's due to whether the the faces needed to be processed more. So in the case of a famous face, it's easier to process because we've kind of seen the face before. And, and so the second time you see it, you don't need to expend as many um, resources to um, process what the face looks like. But for a face that you've never seen before, and keep in mind that these faces were only shown briefly um, with delays, um, with an unfamiliar face, we kind of need more information to process what the face is like. And, and that explains the difference between repetition suppression and repetition enhancement. And then there were also studies where if you have degraded visual input versus very clear visual input, you can likewise see a difference in whether there's suppression or enhancement. Um, so let's see. Let's talk about expectation as gain. And this is the second to last slide. Um, so it, just taking a look at the bigger picture, picture of things here, um, we're kind of assuming that the sensory system is a sort of Bayesian inference processing machine that optimally combines priors and likelihoods to identify the most probable interpretation of the ex external world. But when you think about it like this, this seems to be a very computationally costly process. So in a Bayesian model, you always have um, near zero possibilities. So for instance, if there's a knock on my door, there is a non-zero probability that it's Barack Obama asking me for uh, some sugar. Um, and I mean, it's basically next to impossible for this to happen, but it is possible for this to happen. And I, I yeah, he, he really is uh, 
inviting me to open that door in this example, isn't he? Um, he needs that sugar. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's near zero, but it's like, it's really unexpected. And like, do we really want to devote, devote resources to something that's so unlikely? Um, but according to this Bayesian model, we do have to expend resources somewhat to account for these possibilities. Um, and, and so one idea is that maybe adaptation may allow resources to be focused only on those alternatives that are expected, given some sort of context. Um, and, and one theory that they propose that may better explain this, um, this seeming confusing idea of Barack Obama at my door is uh, the expectation is sharpening theory. Um, so according to this, expected stimulus, expected sensory information are, um, are received or interpreted by the brain in terms of a sort of neural sharpening and unexpected sensory information is subject to neural dampening. And by, by dampening, I mean that, um, there may be more overall, like, aggregate neural activity, but it's very, um, insensitive and hard to decode at a population level. Um, so it's, it's a very sort of, um, generalized activation in this case. However, if it were an expected stimulus, we can have very specific and sensitive and um, sharp activation. And, and, and how they think about that is that we can sort of inhibit, perhaps, um, information that we're not expecting. And so we can have this nice sensory um, specificity when an expected stimulus does arise. And then the opposite of, is true for unexpected stimuli. Um, so, for instance, if you were to hear um, an auditory tone that predicts an oriented grading, um, the, the expectation suppression in, in early visual cortex is accompanied by a heightened ability to classify this information um, using, say, some sort of pattern classifier on the brain. Um, and if we were to try to decode a grading that was unexpected, we would have difficulty. But if we were to look at the area of the brain that represents this um, grading, then there will still be activation here, and it will be increased activation, but just not as sensitive. Um, so let me end here, because this was sort of long, I think. Um, closing comments. Um, Visual expectation is obviously super important and useful, and it's constantly employed by the brain. Um, we were constantly making inferences about what we're going to experience, and we're making use of this information, and there's neural bases for expectations effects on neural processing, but it's difficult to examine how visual expectation works, and also hard to dissociate it from the process of attention. So if we were to look anywhere deeper in the brain for this, so the cellular level, the microcircuitry that allows the integration of bottom-up and top-down um, information, it gets very confusing and um, people don't know what's going on. And we don't know how predictions and prediction errors are generated in the brain. Is it due to connectivity, oscillations, neurochemistry, differences in cell types? We don't know. And that's um, I mean, this is an open discussion for how we actually compute um, predictive information. Um, but the predictive coding model is one attempt at this that seems to be pretty um, well-founded. And um, it's also pretty easy to go down the rabbit hole with this idea. So when I was looking up studies that, you know, were citing this paper and talking more about these things, um, some people talk about the brain as being a completely Bayesian processing machine, right? Um, so like all aspects of the brain, including like memory, learning, perception, mo uh, motion, and, and like motivation, all of these things rely on the same underlying framework of expectation and and. and predictability and making inferences about what's about to happen. But we don't really know if it's the same mechanism for um, 
expectation working at all of these levels. And we especially don't know if it's the underlying framework for like everything in the brain. And if the brain is Bayesian, then we need to consider things like irrationality and like a uniform sort of processing structure for across people. And like, what are the implications for this and, and cognition and rationality and consciousness? Um, this is a very confusing topic. And so the bullet point is that it's easy to fall down a rabbit hole. Can I explain Bayesian? Um, it basically, it's, it's simply the idea of, um, getting you from one conditional probability to another conditional probability. Um, so it's, it's like, um, computing the probability of an event occurring given a prior or given some other information. And it's pretty simple, really. Like there's an equation that you can look up that just is like, the probability of A given B equals the probability of B given A times the probability of A, all divided by the probability of B, and that forms the entire structure for um, all of this Bayesian statistics and Bayesian work stuff. Um, does that kind of make sense? Uh, all right. Um, so that's that's all I got. It's uh, definitely an interesting topic, but I could easily see how confusing an area of work this is to get into. All right. Um, so, yeah, this was sort of a long discussion, but does uh, anyone have, like, questions, comments before we go?